Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I like the size of this crowd. I think we'll be able to have conversation as well as maybe some moderation, okay. not too much. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Helen, author of Open Questions, 30 Years of Writing About Art. Um, she's an art historian, a writer, curator at institutions such as the ICA Boston, the Baltimore Museum, and the Wexner Center with her last position as chief curator, curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, which we may or may not get to. We'll see how that goes, right, Helen? I don't know, I never mentioned that yeah. place out loud. <laughs> She's also a critic and most recently a podcaster. Her 2022 podcast about the artist Ana Mendieta has had over 1.2 million hits and named the best of on several industry lists. And she continues with her podcast to this day. Um, a distinctive career um, with several chapters captured in these essays, each chapter an evolution in her writing and engagement with artists in their work. I loved one quote that I read about Helen um, as the art world's most beloved provocateur. Um, Helen has taken on topics from insightful retrospective essays to intensely personal reflections on her life with artists. So welcome. It's great to have you here in New Orleans, Helen. Thank you so much, Susan. I love being in New Orleans. <laughs> you love I having love this you. place. Yeah. Good place to be. So I asked Helen to get us started with um, reading an excerpt from her essay, Open Questions, um, introducing the book, and which also frames her experiences as a writer. So I thought we'd use that to get started. Helen? Okay, so I'm gonna read, first off, thank you so much for being here. Um, the names at this festival are, you know, they're kind of like marquee names, so that you're in this room with me, I'm really grateful. Um, because you could apparently be listening to Liz Cheney somewhere. <laughs> and what can I say? Um, Liz, Helen. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a balancing it's act. It's a balance. Uh, so Susan has asked me to read, um, I'm gonna read like a little bit from the introduction to the book and then a little bit from a chapter on an artist, an essay on an artist named Lisa Yaskovich. Um Lisa makes some of the most difficult embracing paintings of the contemporary art world. Um, she basically makes like nudie pictures of white women. Um, they're so hard to look at and they're so good to look at. Um, and I'll read a little bit of that essay as well. Just I think to give you um, a sense of voice or concerns. But this is from the, the opening the introductory essay. I've asked myself fairly regularly over the past three decades, why do I love art? I love art because it's difficult. I think the world is an incredibly complex place and art is an amazing lever for cracking the case. Art is a form of knowledge. It's a practice of investigation Perens, science, journalism, observation, married, so it's investigation married to the human capacity for and drive toward play. Art is a site where contradictions are engines rather than obstacles. Indeed, art may be one of our most beautifully designed tools for permitting, managing, and valorizing contradiction. I love that art maintains an aura of impenetrability, of obscurity. I love the way art acts like it's a secret, but often does so in public space. I love the way art condenses the feeling, time, and space to a point of almost mutual imbrication of the agency of the person who makes it, the artist, with the agency of the person who looks at it, the viewer. I love art because I love artists. They're the last people in the world who get to say no with impunity. I love the ethics of being an artist, to decide every day that you are one, that you have to be one, and that you, and only you, determines what that means. Um, 
So that's just a little bit of me trying to set the stage. Set the stage. Yeah. For what goes on in the rest of this book. So before you, but before we move on to the other essay, so you have talked a lot about, uh, or I I read somewhere where you have talked about um, your role as annotating art history rather than rewriting it. Yeah. And so in these essays, you take on many different issues and I would say contradictions um, rather than obstacles. And you, um, and you, have thought them through, but at the same time, you've revisited some of them. So talk to us about a little bit about what that means to you and how, and how that has manifested itself in the essays. Sure. Thank you. So each section of the book has a preamble where I kind of talk about why I've grouped these essays together. And then several of the essays have codas that I wrote anew. And I did that because I wanted the essays to stand as they were and like because I'm a real like want to have my cake and eat it too kind of girl and I wanted to be able to indicate how much my own thinking had changed over time and compiling the essays really made me realize like oh wow I have I have evolved. (laughs) Like, I don't think the same things I used to think. And instead of trying to correct the record, I thought, that's not right. The record is this evolution of thinking. And I believe in the evolution of thinking because I believe in change. I believe in our capacity for change. And I believe that our capacity for change comes in like a really... um, like some incredibly tight relation to our capacity for hope. Like you, you can't have one without the other. But I also wanted to talk about annotating history instead of rewriting history because I'm, I've spent the last 30 years inside of a history that was constructed um, by, through my absence, you know, like, the history of art is not filled with, um, uh, l- you know, lower class lesbian white women doing work in public. And the work I was interested in, the work of women, the work of people of color, the work of other queer people, wasn't in the history. It wasn't in the canon. So I was sort of used to this problematic history, and I thought, I'm not rewriting it, because what I'm showing you sometimes when I show you a great artist of color or a great, you know, um, woman artist, I'm not entering that person necessarily into the canon. Partly what I'm doing is showing you that there's a canon that doesn't include this greatness, right? Like, so I, I don't want to pretend that we can rewrite the canon to be fair. Like the canon wasn't fair. So I kind of want to deal with that. But I also, in my own writing, wanted to deal with the things that I would read. And I would just be like, oh, wow, I so don't feel, I don't think that way anymore. And I wanted to kind of, I don't know, not quite have all my dirty laundry out on the line, but at least like some clean laundry out on the line, not yet folded. I get that. Yeah. So Helen. Um, Tell me, give me an example of the way that you've, that you feel the canon has expanded. Um, or that you've confronted the canon in a certain way. Well, I think I did a, a bunch of exhibitions that tried to take on problems, whether it was like the problem of the art of the 1980s or the problem of, um, you know, I did a show called Dance Draw about the relationship between dance and drawing. And there's a way you could do that show in which pretty much everyone in it would be white and straight and from New York and (laughs) have touched, you know, the third rail of conceptual art and like showed at John Weber and had like all the right bona fides. And I just, I wasn't, that that show bored me when I put it up on my, my like you know my bulletin board, 
And I was always interested in people who were working adjacent to the canon. Yeah. Like, I think there's a lot of power in adjacency. Um, when you don't have that big spotlight on you, you can actually do other things. So, like, I think Senga Ngudi didn't have a huge spotlight on her, and Trisha Brown did. So it meant that Trisha's work got very formal, and Senga's work got it's more exploded. and more whacked out, like, yeah. every year. Do you know? So, like, there's a... There was something about Senga's in adjacency to the canon that was interesting. Hmm. I think, and I think the canon bears uh, a tremendous amount of critique and responsibility for a new critique. So I yeah. think that that um, is something that we all are confronting in various aspects of our professional work, museum, curatorial, critics. Um, I was careful to um, define you as both a writer and a critic. I, I kind of made that distinction. I just hope you appreciated that distinction. What is the distinction for you between well, a writer think, and a critic? So because I, I think, need to know the... Well, well I think um, the role of the critic traditionally has been some, and has been um, observed to be a, um, a place where uh, people write, maybe not for the public, but for one another. Mm. And the notion of the of the critic as the arbiter of, don't want to say taste, but the arbiter of the moment is a really interesting phenomenon right. that we're, I think, trying to address and redress in right. some ways. So you were talking about um, writing for your ear, for the ear, right. rather than writing for the critic. And you also talk about writing for the artist. Yes. So I just want to kind of go down that road a little bit with you, um, talk that through. When I talk about writing for the ear, <sighs> I mean, we talk to each other, and I interview a lot of people, and I look at these transcripts of the interviews. And the way we talk to each other, when you read just a straight, legit transcript, we are barely making sense. Yeah, exactly. My point. Very few people speak in full sentences. We're taking up all kind of context clues with each other. We're assuming huge reservoirs of continuity between one another. We say, you know, all the time. I'm pretty sure because we don't. And, and you know what I mean? And, the, and so this is the, the cover for this or anxiety. Or like because it's like, not. Exactly, because it's not. We misuse all the words. I mean, all the words. So that is problematic, but then Academic language, and I say this with all, please, my condolences to my academic siblings. No, she's a recovering art historian. Um, that stuff can be deadly. I mean, it's just deadly. Uh, and it's, it's like reading the law, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's such a professionalized language that it is meant to exclude. So I was trying to find some path and I was very fortunate really early on in my life, in my 20s, I was hired to give public tours of art at the Whitney Museum. I had to tour the Whitney Biennial. This was in the 90s in New York. I am a native New Yorker and we are known for heckling. <laughs> so you'd have to give a public lecture on the Whitney to an audience that was partly interested and partly hostile. And I found this fascinating because you had to figure out who you were talking to and you had to figure out how to meet them where they were without dumbing down what you wanted to say because if you dumb down stuff for an audience, man, that audience will smell you like a rat. They will know they are being spoken down to and they will not have it. So that was the place where I began to try and craft this voice where, um, where my own earnestness uh, about my love of this stuff could have a place and my own sense of how, um, 
how much I believe, like I really do believe art and culture changes the world. Like the big, the big culture shift we're in right now, it's actually already been happening in the art world for the last 20, for the last 20 years. You know, like we're, the art world is out ahead. If you want to talk about decolonization, people in the art world have been talking about that for 20 years. So, like, I believe that in the force of these things. And I wanted to be able to talk to, like, regular folk in a regular folk language. Do you think, I, I'm, I'm struck by this notion of um, advancing an argument early or decolonization, for example. Why do you think that those conversations didn't break through sooner? Why do we see it in a broader context now as opposed to having, been, having discussed it 20 years, yeah, 15, yeah. 10 years ago? What, Why don't they break through? Well, because I do think that a lot of art, I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons. It's a really good question. I think a lot of art takes place in very small places. Mm -hmm. And even the art that breaks through into like a, something like the Whitney Biennial, that takes time. And then it goes away. And then it goes away. Um, there's the world of ideas in the art world, and then there's the world of money in the art world. These two circles sometimes have an overlap, and sometimes they do not. So, you know, in 1979, Cindy Sherman does those film stills where she does herself imaged in all those different poses. That's the beginning of the questioning of gender. Mm -hmm. um, Judy Butler's Gender Trouble comes out in 90. Mm -hmm. So already, you know, and it probably took about from 79 to 90 for Cindy Sherman to be totally dominant in the art world. And then another 10 years for her to become one of the few women artists who has an auction record that rings out and so now Cindy Sherman is some, an artist that like you might not know a lot about art, but you might know about Cindy Sherman. So I just think, I actually think art's really slow and I think that's one of its superpowers. So it's one of its superpowers because it has a staying power that evolves over time. Yep. Yeah. I think yeah. art is yeah. still being assimilated or maybe I should say metabolized in analog time, not yeah. digital time. Well, digital time would be impossible. Yeah, digital time. Di yeah. Like, the, the, the phone is not conducive. Like, social media is not conducive to art. Like, they, they actually don't, they, they don't, they don't live comfortably together. Mm, agreed. Yeah. So you talk about, you've talked about, in a curatorial role, um, the curator as controller of access versus a curator as caretaker. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to talk about that a little bit, Helen? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm 58. So I'm like straight ahead Gen X. And my millennial siblings have taught me that the curator was a gatekeeper. And I was like, gatekeeper? That's not a very nice word. And I had to sit with that like for a minute. Um, it's not the most interesting version of a curator, though. Mm -hmm. A curator, the Latin root of the word, is to care for. Um, and I think of the curator in a museum is um, a custodian of objects uh, with all of the implications of what the word custodian would mean there. Like, what does it mean to take care of objects. And for me, because, because my church is, the, is art, um, when I'm taking care, when I'm entrusted to take care of an art object, I'm also taking care of an artist. I'm taking care of an artist's legacy. I'm taking care of their ideas. I'm taking care of what was important to them so that I can hopefully then put it in public. And then what I learned uh, as, a, as a curator was that one then also needed to figure out how does one care for the public too, right? That was for me a big shift. Like how do I, how do I care for this public that comes in? How do I make a museum hospitable um, and 
able for as many people as humanly possible to enter um, feeling some sense of, if not belonging, belonging is a big thing to get right out of the gate, but at least welcome. And access, and having accessibility. Accessibility, but also <clears throat> welcome to this thing that maybe is just a huge fucking mystery and you can't make it accessible. Well, but also the notion of being a custodian is a very passive dynamic in terms of mm. caring for. When we're talking about living artists and engaging with artists, their ideas, and attempting to engage a broader public mm. with those same ideas, it's a different dynamic for a curator. It is, because then you're often in the... Or I thought I was often in the role of... Um, Translator, yeah, or the very famous, dearly departed curator Okui and Wizor, used to say that the curator is like a diplomat. Like you go to the director's office, and they got their concerns, and then the trustees got their concerns, and then the dealers got their concerns, and the artists got their concerns, and the curator is the person, like spinning navigating and spinning the plates to basically get people who are antagonistic towards each other to come together to make the next thing happen. So do you think the role of the curator is ne has, it has changed? Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit how it has changed and what the active versus the passive might mean and also this idea of, that you mentioned accessibility and belonging. Mm. I think there, and, and a responsibility to audience and community, which is very, different from this passive role that we talked about as right. custodian? Well, I mean, it's so, it's the, the <laughs> um, in the wake of the civil rights movement when white people decided to pull all of their children out of the public school system, I mean, like, that's actually where this story starts. Mm -hmm. Like, you have the, you have, you know, so-called white flight out of, you have, a, you have a white middle class abandonment of the public school system, which meant that a lot of other institutions, the museum prime among them, had to take up certain educational roles that the school system had abandoned. And so the museum became a major educational um, apparatus. I worked at a big city museum. Like I worked at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Every fourth grader in the city came to that museum. Um, we did a terrible job of welcoming them. We did an absolutely terrible job of conveying to those children who were largely, uh, came from working poor families, black and brown families. We did a terrible job of conveying to them that this building was for them, that this was a city museum, and that these objects actually belonged to them. Instead, we were like weird missionaries. This is good for you. You should know about this. Don't touch anything. Shut up. Like, no. Don't talk. Don't talk. Like, we didn't, you know what I mean? Like, who invites someone into their house and then immediately shushes them? You know, I mean, we did just such a bad job of it. And that was when I really began to try and figure out, like, what am I, what am I, what am I actually doing? you know, when I'm in these spaces, and trying to figure out ways to, um, well, reinstall collections, hang different things, do things differently, um, that weren't necessarily about me and my taste and my class formation and my, you know, bougie education, basically. You know, I was trying to just figure out how to, how to be democratic in the face of um, a pursuit that has largely been very elite, you know? I do. Yeah, I bet you do. Yeah. I do. Um, so you've been on this book tour. I'm shifting gears a little bit. Okay. We could go into a whole other area of museum challenges, which would be another hour conversation. Shifting gears, you have been on this book tour for a while. A while. Ten months, mm, maybe. I, November. November. Oh, not that long. Not that long. It's not so bad. Um, what has 
been the most surprising to you in terms of your audience's reactions to your work or to an essay in particular? What seems to have been something that resonated particularly strongly with your audiences? Well, first I have to say the thing I'm always most amazed by is that you're all here and I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I, I just can't believe that people I don't know keep showing up um, to, to, to hear me or to read me. This I find really quite o overwhelming and the, the flattery is, is, is real and the sense of obligation I have is also real. Uh, I think what people, I mean, I think, I, I think they're like slightly different camps of people who they respond to different things. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely like a sapphic sisterhood, um, <laughs> you know, that recognizes, um, like that, you know, that I, that I might've taken a hit or two, I might've taken a hit or two for the team. Um, so I have like my people in my corner that way. I think the work I did with the Underground Museum mm -hmm. um, to try and really reimagine how we might be able to redistribute the wealth of museums um, has mattered to people. And I think that the, I think what people respond to actually often more than anything else is that I'm a storyteller, like that I will tell you a story, um, that you don't, you know, that I will, I will be like, and in the beginning, <laughs> you know, like I, that I don't mind telling you a story with a beginning, middle, and an end, that I, that I, um, that I understand that most people actually really love to be read to, that being read to is a very intimate thing, that, and that we don't get read to as adults. Um, you know, you get read to as a child, and it's incredibly pleasurable to mm. be read to. And to listen. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that's the podcast. I think that's the, and I try to, and that's another way of saying of writing for the ear. I'm, I'm writing in a way where I'm trying to, um, and it's manipulative. Let's not be too rosy about this. I'm, I'm very consciously trying to manipulate you to see to believe in this thing that I believe in. I f I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary. It's a problematic position. Um, <laughs> it is. Art has changed my life. I don't actually know how to be in this horrible, cruel world of ours without it. Like, it's the only thing that continually I rely on that saves me. And so I'm, I feel like I'm constantly walking around like, hey, have you noticed how fucked up everything is? Would you, have you ever thought about it like this? Have you ever thought about it through the lens of this object? I think this object might have some answers for us. Like that's the, I think that's my general vibe. And I think people, I think that's what they're responding to. So at what, tell me about the levels that you can um, use to get at an object. So what are the different ways to get at an object? Because yeah. it's varied, right? There are many different. Contexts. There are many different contexts, um, but there are and there aren't. You know, it's like baseball. You know, like you throw the ball, you hit the ball, you catch the ball. That's the game. <laughs> so you have what the artist thinks. You have your socio-historical economic conditions. Yeah, but those are three things. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. I mean, I tie them up okay. into one. That's Whatever. social art history. Yeah. You have context. I mean, you have the artist's intention, you have the context that the object emerges in, and then you have this other ineffable thing, which is called form. Like, what is the form that the thing takes? And in that form, I think, lie a reservoir of answers. So the I feel like almost anybody can do artist intention. You just go and ask them. And then social art history, like you, know, you read stuff and you do your research. Form is trickier because I think form requires you to be both dumb and smart simultaneously. You have to understand something about the history of form and art, but you also have to be dumb in the face of the object. So in front of an object, I start at a very rudimentary place. 
what are you made of? Which is kind of like asking somebody, where are you from? What are you made of? Oh, you're made of wood. Interesting. Found wood? Bought wood. Wood from a tree that you cut down yourself. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Oh, so you cut down that tree yourself, so on your property, did you cut it on, down on someone else's property? Does it matter that it was an oak tree or a maple tree form? These are the things that you're ticking and ticking and ticking, and this is how the meaning is starting to grow and grow and grow. But in order to do that work, you have to kind of put your, e like that rush to figure out what something means, mm -hmm. you've got to you got to really beat that ego part of yourself back, or at least I do, um, and let, your, let the object have a kind of agency. I'm also very, like, I think I might be Shinto in my religious beliefs. You know what I mean? Like, all the objects have energy. All the objects are animate for me. Nothing is really, truly inanimate in my world. So even these chairs... And we might talk about like the horror of these chairs. <laughs> <laughs> but like even these, these chairs are embedded with information. And humans sat in rooms and made decisions to make these chairs, right? So True. like the, all of what is in the chair, all of the information in this chair is in fact available to us if we are willing to, okay, so when they chose that color brown, what were they thinking, <laughs> right? True. Yeah. So, who, so who are you writing for? Well, that's the ultimate question. <laughs> I used to think I was writing for the artist because I wanted their approval and I wanted them to think I was smart. I wanted to be like the, the artist's curator. I wanted to be like the best. Um, and age has disabused me of some of those desires. Um, and now, and I find my, I, this, I feel very guilty about this answer, but I also know it's the truest one. I'm, I'm writing for myself. I'm writing to figure out what I think. I'm writing to figure out how to keep going. I find, I find this world just, I find the terms of this world very hard. And so to keep going in it, um, I have to, I have to write. That's a good reason. Yeah. And it leads me to another question about how your writing has changed. And you are writing for yourself. Yeah. And there was this important moment in your life which allowed you to think about what that could be. Right. And I asked you if you would read an excerpt from an essay. Yes. That I will. you wrote that kind of embodies that personal, <clears throat> deeply personal approach. Um, yes. And I thought you would want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in 2018, I was um, fired. And in and of itself, that shouldn't be too big a deal, except the way I was fired was bonkers. And it generated a press, like, I mean, you... There are people who have like legitimately like raped people who didn't get as much press as I, as, like, do you know what I mean? It just didn't make any sense. Like the press around my firing was really, really horrible. And, um, and so I took myself off for a year. I didn't do much of anything uh, and tried to figure out what I, what I wanted to do. And the first essay I wrote was an essay on Lisa Yaskovich, which is art that I have really, like I have really, really liked Lisa's work for years. I never in a million years would have said, 
to any museum director ever, hey, I'd like to do a survey show of Lisa Yuskovich, because that basically would have been like tantamount to saying, I'd like, in, in a year and a half, I would like to be very publicly fired. <laughs> um, so I decided, I'd already been very publicly fired. I might as well write the Lisa Yuskovich essay. Sometime early in the 21st century, I saw an exhibition of Lisa Yuskovich's paintings at the ICA Philadelphia. I had just given up my tenure track academic job for a museum position, and for the first time in my life, the paycheck was real. The money and the title curator made me feel an enormous responsibility to see as many exhibitions as I could, and because I had enough cash to start buying exhibition catalogs, I had the lofty idea of building a library. One of the first things I bought under this new regime was the modest saddle-bound book from Yuskovage's exhibition. When I arrived home, I placed the catalog on the coffee table of my girlfriend's house. Even though I had purchased it, I had no idea to make, I had no idea what to make of the pictures it contained. Girlish figures with impossibly huge tits, Perfect nipples, erect, pink, practically leaning forward, arching toward your mouth. Pubic hair that looked like it had been backlit by a golden setting sun. Juicy asses, round, smooth dimples. Thighs that spread easily. Small waists, round bellies, lips parted, lips puckered, mouths open, veritable tendrils of hair. These were pictures about perpetual availability, Time stilled, time infinite. Paint became flesh in domestic interiors and landscapes rendered in a foam of sea green, sunrise periwinkle, and lemon cream. The figures were girls with women's bodies. They were women with girls' faces. They were a teenage dream, posters on a bedroom wall. They possessed a slight charge of adrenaline as if part of their thrill emanated from the memories of shoplifting scented lip gloss in the mall. They were the shock of the first time I saw pubic hair on my older friend in the locker room at camp in Maine. I'm not sure I'd ever been so embarrassed in my life, embarrassed by a picture, embarrassed by the feeling between my legs when I looked at these pictures, pictures that any reasonable post-act-up abortion rights-supporting, self-regarding feminist with a PhD in art history and a decent job should rightly dismiss out of hand. This parade of sex dolls, an endless supply of white women, each with three holes, open and wet. It's like a Carol Walker for white girls drifted through my cerebral cortex, after which I could not find it in myself to critique the work. I could not bring my inherited baby boomer feminism about body positivity and self-actualization down upon these pictures, nor could I muster any of the proper Marxist antagonisms to images that were clearly meant to be bought and sold on the open market, pictures meant to be hung winkingly above the bed in the master bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms where the his and her closets were larger than the childhood bedroom I shared with my brother. So, very personal. So I'll read the postscript, the coda. This essay was written during my transition from being a full-time member of the Institutional Museum Affiliated Art World to someone who functioned, quote, independently. Writing it reignited my lifelong dream of identifying myself as a writer first and as someone who arranges pictures second. It is telling that it is one of the most explicitly queer texts I've ever written. In addition to being about queerness in general, it is written from a specifically lesbian point of view. It is no small irony that writing about Lisa Yuskovich's work engendered my first explicitly lesbian text. I am keenly aware that I was only able to write this text, which is marbled with terrifying vulnerability because I had lost my job. In this new space of economic and professional precarity, I no longer represented anything other than myself. And since being a lesbian was part of why I was fired, never underestimate the implicit hostility of heterosexual patriarchy 
toward the women who are structurally uninterested in its privileged subjects, either libidinally or intellectually. It seemed all the more important to write explicitly as a lesbian. So this is a new journey. This became a new journey yeah. and became a personal opportunity. It's really an opportunity. It became an opportunity for you to write for yourself yeah. and for other audiences yeah. that you may not have had before. No, because I never could have worked at a museum and written in this voice. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So I thank you. Thank you. I thank you for taking that leap. Thank you. We, we do have time for questions. Um, and there is a... A microphone. A microphone. A microphone. Thank you. Um, that, um, there's a please microphone. raise your hand. I'll bring you the mic. Hi. It's a pleasure to have you here. I was wondering if you could describe an institution's role in identifying, quote, good art. It's large. It's a large role. <clears throat> so how something, how any artwork comes to have value, I think is a part of a networked event. Lots of different types of people have to kind of co-sign, if you will, on that object. Other artists need to like it. Writers need to like it. Some academics need to buy in. Some collectors need to buy it. But there is still this version that the museum, when it comes in, that that is an imprimatur that is very powerful. And what museum comes in is a very powerful imprimatur. Um, the reason the museum is supposed to be the ultimate imprimatur is because the museum's function historically was to remove that object from the marketplace, to arrest its uh, economic value, its, arrest its financial value, and because you're not supposed to sell stuff. That's a different story. Um, <clears throat> because you were going to care for it forever. So the kind of criteria then that it would be subject to would be exacting. So in a general museum or a so-called encyclopedic museum, anything that gets brought in is kind of being held to the bar of the other things that are in that museum. And yeah, and so there's a lot, a lot, a lot of talking and coming to consensus. There's not as much of that anymore because of so many of the mechanisms that we used to establish consensus are gone. Um, there aren't as many magazines. Um, there, aren't, there, isn't, there aren't as many books. There aren't as many forums, you know, big public lectures, uh, certain kinds of exhibitions that test an artist to see like, oh, okay, this, this artist, you know, and then people, are like, yeah, that artist, right? So a lot, of that, a lot of the tools that we used to use to create that consensus have um, become really compromised. And so that's tough. And also we used to have this cannon that you could either pin things to or shoot spitballs at. It was good for both. But then things got so broken open because it was too, one couldn't maintain the fiction anymore that like New York was the center of the art world. Like there is no center of the art world. Or that there was a linear development. Or that there was linear development. You couldn't talk, about, like anyone who stood up and was like, you know, abstract art was invented, you know, by Vasily Kandinsky in 1912, people would be like, um, have you read any of the other books about all the other folks making work, like all over the world? You know what I mean? Like, so things that we used to take for granted that allowed us to create consensus we no longer had. So consensus now is really, really tough. And it's very difficult to maintain value without consensus, which is why the market is now so ascendant. Because the market can maintain, the market's got its own logic about value. And that's being controlled by a hand, you know, like literally a handful of extremely wealthy people. 
um, and the, all the feeder pools, as we used to call them, don't exist anymore. Other questions? It is on? Yeah, oh, yeah. now it's on. Um, do you write, or has art inspired you to write in any other form? Um, you mean like poetry or plays or something like that? Oh, God, I don't have that kind of talent. <laughs> for, me, for me, the other form is the narrative podcast. Like, that's the, um, that's the closest I think I've come to a different form, because writing those is very, very different than writing these essays, um, because a narrative podcast involves all the all the texture of other people's voices and a kind of polyphony, um, where the essay is such a, a kind of it's a kind of monologue structure. Um, but no, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have those. I don't have those chops. <laughs> I wish. Poets are clearly, like, poets rule. <laughs> yeah, like in the art world, dancers rule, and I feel like in the writing world, poets rule. Yeah. Helen, thank you thank so you. much. Do if, you want to, here, uh, one more question. Oh. Yeah, sure. sure. I'll take, yeah. You've got a little bit of paper and everything. That's just, yes. Machine. All right, I'm just going to throw a bunch of sentences out, and we'll see if it turns into a question. That's what I've been doing. Okay, great. <laughs> I wanted to bring this up because you mentioned social media having an antagonistic relationship to creation of art. It's something I've been thinking about for a few years and experiencing. And I'm also thinking about you saying that art is your church. And for me, I think transcendence requires a lot of intimacy. And I've been starting to feel like our kind of nonstop digital connection. It's like a portal away from intimacy. And I don't think it just waters down our connection with each other. I think it fundamentally degrades it. That's my polemic. And if that could at all be true, I'm wondering, what do you think that means for creating art, for experiencing art, if the way that we're experiencing the world is, is different than it ever has been? Great question. Thank you for that. I think social media is on par with cigarettes. Zuckerberg is Philip Morris. Elon Musk is Sackler. These folks have made something that they know is addictive, that they understand is fundamentally corrosive to civic and social life. And they have proceeded anyway. And we have all cop to it. Like, hi, I'm an addict. My name is Helen. I'm on that stupid fucking Instagram. What a waste of my time. What a waste. What an absolute waste of the, of the, the limited number of hours I have left on this earth. And now that we are at war, a terrible, terrible war, and we don't have a forum to talk with one another and come to new ethical frameworks for how to get, how to stop this monstrous brutality. Because all we're doing is um, talking to each other through a corporate platform that does not have our interests at heart, not for a second. And so, in some ways, my belief in art is all the more renewed as a result. Um, my, my belief in what happens when people gather in a place to have what I think you so rightly call an intimate experience with someone else who might not be there and someone who is there, uh, we will need that set of skills and capacities more than ever if we are going to find our way out of this 
particularly dark passage that we are in right now as a people. Um, and I feel like the museums are literally, they're filled with objects that show you not the right path, the right path. They're filled with clues for how to proceed because all whole periods of time have been dark and all artists have had to figure out how to navigate um, this, this our, our fears about being vulnerable in front of one another. But in, you know, this is a time of, I think of in, increased fascism. I mean, I think that this country has always had fascist tendencies. It emerges and submerges. But social media has really amplified those tendencies because it makes us hard in relation to each other. I think what we need to be now is soft in relation to each other. And I don't think you can be soft in a corporate platform designed to make you addicted to it. So yeah, go to the museum, but grab a friend, talk to a stranger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Yeah. Thank Helen, you all thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.